All right. All right. All right. I got to be honest. I am not in midseason form, everybody. I am not in midseason form. I, I got uh, plugging stuff in last minute. I think we're live on X. I think we're live on X. I know we're live on YouTube. I can see the chat. It is great to see many of you. And uh, you know what? I'm just happy to be back on this show. I was gone for a little while. You guys held the fort down to a certain extent. Um, and I'm just happy to be back a part of it. And, um, you know, hey, another day, uh, another day older, Nick. So here we are. Well, happy birthday, Trace. Thank you. The one is showing his birthday during Kansas Jayhawk basketball, too. Yeah. Man, I just, I really uh, set you up for a, a bad, uh, well, a bad birthday here. If we can be honest uh, about Kansas basketball, it uh, it's just one of those things where at this point it's the lowest man on the totem pole type situations. It's the lowest. It's the lowest fandom that I have. Um, so I'll probably get excited about that in a few weeks. But the combination between a busy year, Reds baseball, this podcast. Um, the Packers fortunately being better than I thought. It's just, uh, all that adds up. You can only be, uh, I always say you can only be such a good sports fan I mean, and still have a, you know, um, a wife that you're not divorced and things of that nature. So, um, I'm just thankful that, uh, that I have uh, a nice family that supports what we do. And you know what? I am excited as hell for Reds baseball because I think, I think this is, uh, last year was exciting largely just cause I got back in the swing of things a little bit, you know, obviously I hadn't. And I'd said this on other podcasts. I think I've said it a million times last year. Is like I didn't follow this franchise all that closely well, towards the end of my college days when I was playing, and then I got out and I was coaching, and it just wasn't a main priority to to keep up with the franchise. And then uh, last year I was kind of getting my feet wet, and now it feels like this year um, there's real excitement. You know, like you always have opening day excitement, Nick, but this year's excitement seems palpable it's, it actually seems real versus like the I don't want to say fake that's a very strong term but versus the 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 forced feeling of ah oh, we who knows you know maybe if this guy has a career year or this guy has a career year maybe just maybe they find a chance and they're in the they're in the hunt sometime past the all-star break this would be a situation where I think we could make the case and we'll do during the show of they legitimately have just as good of a chance to win this division as anybody else uh, will they? We'll find out, but I don't know how, uh, I know how you are, Nick. You're excited no matter what. Yeah, you know, I was actually thinking about opening day. Uh, it's funny you, you mentioned that today. I was just thinking about, you know, when we were down there on opening day this year, it was a great party down there, but it, it, it felt like it was a celebration of Cincinnati. Like, right. They yep. hadn't had an official opening day in two years. It was a, a party for Cincinnati. I feel like this year on opening day, it's going to be a lot more about the Reds and the baseball team than just the the excitement that just the the holiday of opening day brings. Correct. I, I, opening day is always going to be a. It's always going to be just a chance uh, for Midwesterners to get out when the sun maybe is shining, maybe it's not, but it's it's a uh, for lack of a better term, it's an opportunity to get out and drink uh, in the middle of the day for a lot of people. And anytime you have that and you can kind of force that upon a city and, uh, your employer in your work allows that, then guess what? Society is going to take advantage and that's what they do in Cincinnati. And I love the fact that we have opening day in Cincinnati every single year. That's great. I think that the, the city, uh, making a big deal about it is great. But this is, as I said before, this seems like it's a real excitement for the baseball fans, at least, that it's not just opening day. There's there's, there's more to this season than just, uh, oh, it's opening day, and you don't have to worry about the jokes of, of, uh, of, I think last year there was a joke made to me after the first day on opening day when they lost. Uh, someone made the joke, well, that's our last chance to get to 500, you know, and you know, it turns out the joke was on them a little bit, but... All right, uh, we have a lot to get to. I think that there's... I, I have scheduled uh, the live stream on X uh, for an hour and 15 minutes. The chances of that happening, I don't know. Don't seem very high. But who knows? Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Uh, but we have a lot of updates. We've got a lot of things uh, going on, now, whether it be the website, whether it be the season ticket group, when we're going to do the ticket drawing, um, when we're going to do the drafting, what we're going to do for spring training, um, where would you like to start, Nick? I mean, there's like five things that we could talk about here and discuss, 
I know many people want to talk about Reds baseball, but just to kind of get some of the housekeeping stuff out of the way, people are already somewhat asking, if you want to call it that, um, about what we're doing. Where would you like to start? Well, I, I don't know what's uh, officially allowed to be said and what's not. Oh, like, it's it's uh, it's it's all allowed to be said, man. This isn't uh, this isn't uh, this isn't a place to where you know we hold we hold information hostage. You're the, you're the boss, man. Yeah. I don't know. You start. You well, start. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to shoot myself with the foot. No, I'll start off by saying the things that I know that I know about, and you can start off saying the things about you know about. So, for those that don't know, Nick obviously started uh, full time uh, right at the beginning of the new year. And that just so happened to be, and I had planned this trip months, months, months ago. That just so happened to be the same time that I went on a two-week hiatus. And really, we had not had a whole lot of conversation. And I feel like now I'm just starting to kind of get my, uh, my, my feet back underneath me here. Got all the emails out of the way. And, uh, and really, we haven't had a chance to discuss at length about what the, the, the new site's going to uh, have, this, that, and the other. So I'll kind of leave that, that ball in your court. As far as the season ticket groups... Uh, we still do have, obviously, some opportunities left uh, to be a part of that. I've not pushed that yet hard because I wanted to get a nice, good count on that. To be clear, what it is, um, it's – I could probably pull it up here in a second to give you an exact number, um, but I want to say it's four payments of $49 uh, or one payment maybe of 175 I You have to pull that up, Nick, maybe let me know. But nonetheless, uh, you get eight tickets. I know many of you probably have heard this a thousand times, and you're guaranteed an opportunity to get – a postseason, uh, postseason tickets, if you so choose. So I don't know if you don't know uh, how postseason tickets work, but they come in what they call ticket packages, or you know, um, I don't know what they actually call them specifically, but they're like ticket stubs where you have to buy a single ticket for the entire postseason, which becomes really absurdly difficult financially for. I don't want to call it middle class families, but a middle class family, right? You might have season tickets, but then they say, okay, well, you have to purchase. Uh, if you want tickets for the playoffs, you can purchase them, but you have to purchase literally every game of every round possible. And I don't know if you know that, but that adds up to being a lot of money. Whether they actually go to those games or not, you still pay it, and then they refund your money. It's it's a I don't want to call it a scam because then it sounds like I'm being negative towards Major League Baseball, but. It's certainly a way for them to get as a, an absorbent amount of money, hold on to that money for like a month and a half, and then all of a sudden have to reimburse a bunch of people after the fact. So, um, so anyways, simply put, it is an excellent way to buy in at a low cost for an opportunity to be guaranteed to get a postseason ticket at face value and go to eight or go to four games or two games, depending on how many tickets you want. You get eight total tickets in the package, and it's face value. We don't make a single dollar off of it. The goal was just to build a community like we've already done here. So my goal is over time, hopefully in the next five years, is to build up a, a really strong community where we have a decent amount of seats and we, with inside of our group, can exchange them if we have something come up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that paints the picture for what that is. When are we going to do that draft? Well, let me tell you first about spring training. So I don't have the exact details in regards to what that trip will be, but it's going to finish, okay? It's going to end on Selection Sunday. We are going to leave around the beginning of March, and we are going to be in Arizona for, I don't know, call it a week, week and a half, somewhere in that ballpark. And we're going to do content on the way out there. We're going to do content while we're there, and we're going to do content all the way back. Um, so hopefully you will enjoy that. We'll try our best to be as prepared when we get out there as humanly possible. We'll do our best to get as many media credentials as humanly possible. So when we get there, we have a plan and we want to provide you with as, as, as much coverage as we possibly can while we're out there. The odds and ends things too. Like it's not just going to be the, the the box score stuff that you're going to be able to see. It might be something on the backfields of, of of guys that maybe we've never got a chance to even see before. Maybe there's some international players that no one's ever seen on camera before. And it, it's more or less just an opportunity for us to 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 cover this franchise from top to bottom as best we can. Obviously, we appreciate DSC for supporting us and really giving Nick an opportunity to do this full time. And I think at, at the end of the day, our goal is to try to make this uh, at least the most authentic place 
that you can go to find Red's content. And you know, ultimately that 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 requires effort and energy. And I think if uh, nothing will display that more than driving all the way across the country, I will tell you, Nick. Um, I'm leaning more towards driving more than I am flying. People have said, oh, you need to fly. Look at the price. It's going to cost you less. You're going to get there faster. There's something about just going on the road and having a camera in your face the whole time and and doing content and who knows what happens, you know? It's almost like you might miss out on something that you never expected in a million years. I uh, Not that that we're going to do this the first year. I even told Elliot it'd be funny to have like a, a super chat uh, have a live stream inside the van the entire time and have a super chat thing on there. And the only way that we're even allowed to, to, um, to end our trip is if we don't meet the next day's budget, you know, like it, would it be crazy just to be on the road for three months because you have random, uh, people that are, that are, they're being nice, but they're not being nice. You know, they send like a hundred dollars in and that gets you over the hump of, Three hundred dollars a day, so you have to go to another hotel. That we're not doing that to be clear, Nick. I don't want to get you scared or anything like that. But maybe down the road, you might just—I uh, don't know. It just seems like a good. It seems like a good idea. It seems like a good idea. I don't know. Maybe it's a bad idea, but that's here nor there. So Reds content in spring training. We get back on Selection Sunday for March Madness. We are going to do the draft that week before March Madness, um, and then after that, we will do the raffle. Uh, we will do the raffle for the opening day tickets for anybody that's in that group. And um, that's that. I know that there is obviously something else that some people are asking about, which is on February 1st. I did not put Nick in the best position to succeed, considering I was gone for two weeks. He probably has questions about the website, how you're supposed to do things. But I just kind of threw him to the wolves, everybody. I just literally threw him right in the fire. I don't know how it's going, Nick, but uh, you're, you you want to give the, the people an update on that. Yeah, I'm not sure how how beautifully formatted it'll be to start, but uh, I do have something really cool. Uh, our guy Bryce Spalding uh, ranked his top 25 Reds prospects, and uh, I recorded with him audio from him talking about each prospect, and then I'm overlaying that with some video highlights of each prospect. So uh, I'm working on that. That should hopefully be ready to go February 1st. Um, and, and there'll be an individual video for each one that you guys will get to see. And then uh, I also have a couple writers supposed to uh, send me some stuff this week, get their first column up. I'm going to try to also get a little something up um, on that. I know, Trace, we had talked a little bit about I, – I, I think people – we want people to view this, though, as kind of a way to support us and what we do more so than you're going to get a full you know, bang for your buck on this. Um, this, is, this is just kind of a way to – you know, I know a lot of people like to, to give us super chats and things like that. This is maybe a way that you could, you know, support us a little bit, get a little bit back as well, and we'll kind of see where this goes. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the videos are turning out really cool. I think people that are interested in Red's prospects, even casually, uh, I think they'll really like this. These aren't going to be super long, crazy long, intensive interviews, but a nice little um, piece about each one with some actual, you can see with your eyes the players. Um, so I think people will... Uh, well, like that, I saw some other people ask about some additional podcasting content. Uh, I scheduled. I'm recording something on Friday with a really cool guest. I'm not going to spoil it yet, uh, but look for that next week. Um, it's going to be something very interesting, that, and it'll be uh, YouTube only. It won't be a podcast version. Um, but then I'm also, one thing I want to do, and I wanted to wait a little bit until we got a little bit closer because teams are, are changing. I'm going to try to get in contact with uh, someone from each of the Reds' rivals in the NL Central um, a beat writer or someone of that nature and record a little uh, preview of each team. And we'll get that out throughout February. And then once spring training starts, not exactly sure how this is going to work on the road completely, uh, but we'll do a, we'll have a podcast version after every spring training game in the morning. So once I think February 26th is the first game. Once that hits, our plan is to have a podcast in your feed every single morning. We did that all of last year. We didn't miss a single one. So that's kind of, Kind of where we're at. Can't wait to uh, kind of get things uh, rolling here. Yeah, no doubt. And I think uh, one quick question Alex had was, "What's going to be behind the paywall? What's what's what's?" Uh, listen, all the things that you've already uh, come to expect in regards to this show and things that we've done in the past is is going to continue to be not behind a paywall. It's going to be free. The go- listen. Let me say this: like the goal with a paywall is not to get rich by any means. It's just a, it's 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 more or less an opportunity in my eyes. Hopefully 
just to give people that really do appreciate the content that, that Nick does and Bryce and, and, you know, um, and I'm going to miss people, so I'm just going to stop, but it gives, it gives us an opportunity where you can kind of show your appreciation in that way. And hopefully on, on our end, we can just take those resources and funds and it can, again, just cover the cost of, of going and covering something that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. You know, we're really just going to take the resources we obtain, push them right back into the product and see how good of a product we can make it. And that's really why we, I think why we've had success at Chatterbox. I don't, not a hundred percent sure of that, but most of the time it's, it's really much focusing as, as much on the product as possible. And I don't want people to worry about us changing things or doing things differently because we're trying to make money, this, that, and the other. That's not really the goal of um of what we're doing so everything that you've come to expect or that you already know about is going to continue to be free and right here and maybe the previews and the extra things that that we are going to plan on doing those are the things that you might be see behind uh the chatterbox red site and things of that nature so hopefully that kind of clears up that part of it um and of course if you have any questions or comments or concerns or things of that nature you can always reach out to us i'm not now I'm pretty pretty good, not great, but pretty good at responding to to emails or fan um, questions or whatever it may be. Because um, at the end of the day, you're the reason we get to do this. Um, any Trace, other final updates before we get into some you, red stuff? You, are you able to share anything about what you uh, did on Saturday? Yes, I can share that. So that's uh, that's some other fun stuff. Um, Justin Kenner of 1410 Wing AM in uh, Dayton. You might have seen him with us at uh, Reds Fest. Uh, I got a chance to go on the Reds Caravan. And when I say on the caravan, I was in the Dayton stop in the Air Force Museum. I was able to speak with uh, David Bell. I got David to laugh a few times. That was really my only goal when I went up to interview him. And I got to uh, have an interview with Frankie Montas. Um, unfortunately... Montaz, the 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 radio equipment kind of was was being a little flaky on us, so we'll see what all of the interview we got out of that. But we're gonna put that inside of a podcast form when we get it. For those that uh, that are probably wondering, you know, I thought I would save the the I thought I would save the Oakland discussion for when we when we had our next encounter with David. So I was this was more of a this was more of a friendship building. And by friendship, I mean just, hey, he knows my face, I know his. Well, obviously, I know his, but he didn't know mine. Um, next time, I'm going to hit him with it. In fact, if he didn't sign it, this is a true story, folks. If he didn't sign the lineup card already, uh, I was taking that lineup card with me, and I was going to have him actually sign it. But he already signed it because it's the lineup card. It's, it's literally already signed right there by David Bell. Um, but, no, I asked him some fun things. You know, we brought up the ejections that that you uh, let me know about, Nick. Uh, he thought that was pretty funny. I asked him about the starting pitchers and uh, how he goes about kind of evaluating that situation because he's going to have a tough decision if nobody gets hurt. Um, I did tell him, luckily for him, according to Nick Kirby, at some point someone probably will get injured. We're not rooting for that, but someone will probably get injured. I didn't really say that, Nick, but I thought about it. It was in my head while I was interviewing him. I was like, eh, I won't do that. But anyways, I did ask him about that. He, he had made uh, mention about what he looks for and how much emphasis he puts on spring training and how they look in spring training versus you know other areas that he takes a peek at. I thought that was insightful. So all of that will be coming uh, to you in the near future. Uh, but in the interim, we're doing a Chatterbox Red Show tonight, and we are talking about positions, and we're talking about the NL Central. And um, we've got a finally somewhat gotten past, in, past the transactions and the things of that nature of what are the Reds going to do. We've obviously, and they've made some moves. They've signed some guys, but we're kind of getting to the position now where, hey, this is the squad we're going to roll into uh, heading into 2024. And what, are, you know, what now? What does this look like moving forward? So, um, Nick, your overall impressions, I guess, of the fact that I think we're Done. Although I, JD Martinez, um, still available. Just saying. Yeah, uh, the Jorge Soler is still available. Although uh, I don't want to. When we get into the DH part of this this discussion, I, I'm like, man, he really fits the Cubs well. Like they they should go get him. Um, Which one? But yeah, Both? I, 
Solaire. Well, either okay. one. Either one would be a great fit for them. They 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 really are the one team that I think could really use that. Um, I, I, a guy that I threw out last night on on Twitter.com was Kyle Lewis. He was a guy that was non tendered uh, by the Diamondbacks uh, this off season. Was a, a really highly rated prospect. Came up and uh, um, played really well with the Mariners, but kind of injuries have kind of derailed him. Uh, I think he's a guy maybe. You could get on a minor league deal, uh, if not a minor league deal, a very low, you know, major league contract. I think he might be a guy that that's worth the flyer if we're talking about like that. I know a lot of people have wanted guys like Robbie Grossman and um, Adam Duvall and those type of like that a guy to replace Stuart Fairchild or or give Stuart Fairchild some competition in in spring or whatever. I think Kyle Lewis would be a guy that really makes so much sense for the Reds um, if if he's you know if he would be interested in, in, in the Reds, because he's probably going to be looking more for an opportunity versus a contract. No, I, listen, for those that are looking for, for off-season updates, um, what are you, what's your thought on the, on the on the arbitration with Jonathan India? I mean, at this point, does it matter? Like, well, I, I, most of the time, you don't want to go to arbitration because you, you really don't want to try to uh, upset folks, really, right? Like, there's going to be feelings hurt more often than not if you go to arbitration. I'm not saying it doesn't matter with Jonathan India, but I think we've already... I mean, I'm not saying we couldn't piss off Jonathan India any more than the Reds already have, but I don't think Jonathan India and the Reds have this, like, uh, bromance, this honeymoon uh, that it, that currently exists. <laughs> Consider they've, they've clearly tried to shop him. They've told him they're going to shop him, and... He's still around, but do you think that that matters at all? Yeah, I try to get the sports book out of there. It just it, it's it's somehow in like every slide it, it sneaks in there. Uh, no, I don't. Th- the Reds changed their philosophy on this, um, where they pretty much are the trial and fire trial and file, um, where they they give a number, player gives a number, and there's no negotiation. They used to try to avoid arbitration at all costs, but they they switched the system, which it sounds like more more teams are, are with that. So it really absolutely means nothing. Um, again, Reds and Lucas Sims went to arbitration last year. I think I mentioned that before. It didn't seem to have any long-term consequences whatsoever for the season. Lucas Sims seems as happy as anyone else out there um, on the Reds. So, um, but this is just kind of the, I mean, we're, we're in January. There's not a whole lot of big time uh, storylines here. So I, I put that one in there. Uh, the other one, Daniel Duarte was traded to the Rangers to make room for Brett Suter later DFA'd. So obviously it sounds like the Reds probably picked the right pitcher. If, if he was, you know, DFA'd not claimed by anyone else, um, that, that kind of gives you a good, good indication of his value. Um, and then just some other like NL central notes. We'll kind of get through this as we go through each, each position, but the Cubs, they acquired Michael Bush from the Dodgers and in, in part of a big trade uh, Cubs, they signed Hector Neris as well. A really nice relief pitcher. Brewers made a big splash. They signed Reese Hoskins, and the Pirates signed Aroldis Chapman. That's just kind of the the offseason updates over the last month or so, just to kind of fill fill everyone in. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, Darren, I think, was it Darren? Who was it in the chat? I don't want to give anybody. Um, who was it here? Uh, Carrick mentioned that uh, obviously you can save the money and trade. I have a quick question about that. This is where the, the off-season stuff, and maybe I'm throwing you on the spot and you don't know either, and if neither of us know, that's okay. We'll figure out the right answer eventually. Is that if if the Reds were to trade uh, India to somebody, would he have to go to arbitration with them? Yeah, I would assume so. Because, I mean, he's still up for arbitration. He hasn't really had his case, so he's going to have to... Yeah. I don't know if that plays a role at all within within kind of a trade situation because I mean we're not talking about a mass difference in money here about the difference between what he could possibly get and what he's asking for. Um, so I don't know if that's the difference in in really holding up a trade. I highly doubt it, but it's just something to keep in mind. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's I I've never heard of a player getting traded in the middle of an arbitration process. So uh, yeah, I guess it's I guess it's possible at this um, point it feels yeah, likely that he's here right at this point i mean i i think i would be surprised at this point if he's not breaking if he's not uh in spring training with the reds to start i would not be shocked if he gets traded in the middle of spring training another team has an injury that you know that there's a team more desperate um 
I I think the Reds might kind of want to say, all right, Jonathan, let's have him come to spring training. We've asked you to kind of take some, you know, do some work on, on play in the outfield. The Reds might kind of also want to see how he looks in the outfield in spring training as part of their evaluation of, all right, well, if he's, if we get into spring, we we're, we're, um, you know, he's taking fly balls and he looks really bad. Doesn't look like that's a possibility. Then they might be a little more motivated. All yeah. right, well, we'll maybe take a little lesser. We want more, but he's not really going to have a ton of value to us because we don't think he can play the defense. If he comes, he looks great in left field. Reds might be like, hey, you're going to have to pay a, a, a high premium for this guy because he actually, we think, might have some real value to this team. So I think that also might be kind of something that 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 comes into to play with this. Um. Yeah, shout shout out to uh, shout out to Jonathan India. Congrats on his little baby girl. And also, you know, I know that you know we usually don't really get into the personal stuff and all that, but uh, I hope Jake Fraley. Um, I, I really hope that his family is doing okay as well. He's uh, he's dealing with a tough situation there, and uh, you know these guys, these people are humans, obviously, and it's just uh, sometimes you wonder if that's going to affect him in any way. It has to. I mean, I don't see how it couldn't. Um, so you know, it'll be interesting see kind of how all this plays out they so. get a they get a, a i think a clear bill of health last i heard but okay yeah that was a really great story from uh, uh shout out joe joe daneman and uh fox 19 yeah, on that good job really, really cool story on uh on fraley but yeah it sounds like everything's good so um we'll uh keep uh the fraley's in our thoughts and prayers that's fantastic i did not know that that's news to me that must have been when i was either gone or i don't know that's great that's fantastic actually You're, so. Yeah, you were on the boat, boat somewhere. <laughs> yeah, somewhere in the middle of who knows where. Um, all right, uh, Reds versus the NL Central. You're going to try to break this down by position, and I'm going to give you the same damn answer almost every single time, and I'm going to try not to do that. I was thinking today how I can make this spicy, how I can make this interesting, um, but I'll kind of let I'll kind of do this. I'll, I'll let you break down each position group, and then from there we can kind of discuss uh, where we feel like not where we stand specifically player per player per player per player, but just an overall picture of, of kind of who has the edge and what area of need, if any, do the Reds have in that spot. All right, so quick quick preface as we go through this. Uh, all players only got put on one position. Uh, so, like, I could put Spencer Steer as the backup right fielder, the backup left fielder, the backup second baseman, the backup – you, you get my point, but I didn't really feel like that was fair when you're trying to evaluate these positions. So for right field, I st- I have the Jake Fraley Spencer steer platoon. I don't think that's exactly how it's going to shake out, but if you have to put them in a position, I think this is kind of where it's at. So obviously this position looks really damn good for the Reds. Um, if that was a, a full-time platoon, but I don't expect that to be a full-time platoon Cubs, uh, say Suzuki had a really good year last year, uh, outside of catching balls in Atlanta. Uh, Sal Frelick, the really uh, promising Brewers prospect, um, played really well um, I mean, his his limited time. Uh, for the Pirates, they have Joshua Palacios and Edward Olivarios. And in the Cardinals, they have Jordan Walker, uh, who looked really, really good after he came back up after um, uh, a slow start. So uh, I think this is a pretty competitive uh, right field. Obviously, the Pirates are kind of the, the weak link there. But sure. um Jordan Walker and the Cardinals are probably the favorite. Uh, just because I mean, Jordan Walker was the number one prospect in all the baseball. Cardinals fans view Jordan Walker, fair or not, how we view Ellie De La Cruz. I think it's fair. I, I know that our, I, I know, listen, I know that there's been like fun humor. You know, there's been humorous things back and forth between the Reds fan base and the Cardinals fan base when it came to last year. And, you know, like it or not, some of the, some of the frustrations, some of the um, early struggles, that Walker had Ellie Ellie had as well. Um, it's not like he didn't. It's just that if anything, though, it's easy to argue what we always do, which is position group. If you have an elite shortstop or you have a, a right fielder that smashes baseballs, um, everyone's going to take the elite shortstop. So um, I don't know if it's really fair to compare the two, but they're going to be compared for a short term, at least until maybe they're both established in the big leagues and or one one doesn't play as well and one does. So. Um, I don't know. Jordan Walker probably is certainly the highest ceiling out of everybody. Yeah. So, so South Frelix, a guy to watch. Um, he, he definitely has a lot of promise, um, with the Brewers. You're not sure with a guy like him, you know, playing a position like right field, but it doesn't seem like he has a ton of power, but, 
Uh, man, the Brewers love him. So we'll, he's we'll, quick, we'll, man. Uh, yeah, he made some plays he, too. He made he, defensively. Yeah. The kid made some plays. He feels like a Brewer. That's for sure. Yeah, he makes like, plays. He, he's a good defensive player. Yeah. Just, good defensive player. Just kind of weak you off. Yeah, he just you you wonder how the Brewers win games, and then you're just like, oh well, they just it just turns out they got a lot of good pitchers, and they don't drop the ball in the field. It's just a pretty decent formula. Not fun. Not pretty. You look at their lineup and you laugh. But shit, it wins games, so good for them. Yeah, as I was going through the Brewers, are like, they the Steelers? I mean, I know you're not an NFL guy, but it kind of feels like the Brewers are the Steelers. Like they're just gross. That's a good, good. They're kind of gross, <laughs> but they win. Like they just they just keep winning. But nothing about it makes you feel good. Go ahead. Yeah, when I was just going through their lineup, like it was like, how are these guys going to win games? But I was like, you know, I've said that for like five years, and somehow they keep winning ninety games every year. But all right, to center field, Reds, we got TJ Friedel. I left him all by his lonesome out there. No platoon, nothing. I think he's probably the favorite to be a everyday starting center fielder at this point, and I think he deserves it. Uh, the Cubs, Mike Talkman is, is probably penciled in right now, but Pete Crow Armstrong is certainly the guy they're going to look to go to in the near future. Uh, Brewers, their highly ranked prospect, Jackson uh, Churio, who they uh, just signed to a big contract extension. Also have Garrett Mitchell, another highly ranked prospect with that with a bunch of injuries last year. Um, really solid as well. That might be a platoon situation. Um, Pirates, I think this is a guy that a lot of people sleep on. As I think is a really, really good player, Jack Sawinski. And then the Cardinals, Tommy Edmond. He probably projects as a center fielder, but he can also play second base in other positions as well. So that's kind of where we're at center field i trace i think tj friedel could be the best player on this list good this is where i'm gonna say he could be the best he could be he could have the worst season of all of them i don't know yeah you know no, it's You're like uh wrong. yeah and i know i know uh i i know craig uh sandlin who's obviously on the show as well he made the joke uh he can't wait to hear hear us say that because you know that, that's the truth though that is the absolute truth about a good amount of these positions uh tj friedel feels like an x factor i think that there's a few x factors on this team uh, that if they have a good season, and that doesn't mean they need to have career years, but if they have a good season, I think that this team will exceed expectations. And when I say when I say exceed expectations, I mean the seventy to nine win total that 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 the Reds are projected to have. And I'm not suggesting for any second that if they win eighty games, that we should all go fly a banner. Okay, I don't want to hear anybody come in here and act like that's what I'm saying because I am not saying that, and I want it to be very clear that I'm not saying that. But I'm going to use that as my parameter because that is what people outside of our jurisdiction, outside of what we think about this Reds franchise, say about them. So if this team were to win more than 79 games, TJ Friedel is one of three players on this entire team that I think is an X factor. And on, the reason for that is, is because that is a premium position that this franchise has desired for a long time to have somebody out there that has been consistent, and they have not had that for, for a, like we've talked about before, a long time. And hopefully, hopefully TJ will make that work. Also, I want to make it be very clear. Um, I did make a rookie mistake here before I turn it on. There's a small chance that my battery dies at some point in the show, but that's okay because I have bought extra batteries, and they're charging. So maybe... I might be out of commission for a second, but hopefully in a short time, I'll get it back. Just want to put that in there before that happens because it's going to happen. Um, but that's my thoughts on TJ Friedel. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right there. Uh, I, I think he, I do think he's, I do think he's like, if you're talking about wins above replacement, I think he's pretty safely like a two win player just because of like his defensive value, his speed, you know, all those kind of things. It's just really a matter of is he, you know, just a nice defensive center fielder that can hit a little bit, or is he that guy last year that was a legitimate, like like TJ Friedel was an all star caliber player if you take the full season into uh, into perspective. So, but yeah, I think Jack Swinski on the Pirates side is maybe that same thing as TJ Friedel guy hit twenty six home runs last year. If he can get his batting average up a little bit, his on base percentage up a little bit. He's kind of the X factor for the Pirates that could also kind of take them to the next level as well. Pirates are a sneaky team. I put that out. I obviously put the post out a few days ago or whatever it was been now a week ago. Um, I, they they shouldn't. I mean, maybe they'll they'll make fools of me, and if they do, that's fine. They're the Pirates. Um, it just doesn't seem like they should be that long of odds to 
to win the division. I mean, you have, I think off the top of my head around sports books, it's generally, it's about plus, I think it's 190 for, for the Cardinals around plus, I think 290 for the Cubs. I think the Brewers are like right behind them. And then the Reds are 325. And then the Pirates are like plus 2000, plus 2500. I don't know. Maybe I'm just naive, but th- th- this Pirates team also played pretty damn good baseball. And then, I mean, I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but they had some pretty key injuries. And the Reds did too, yes. But, I mean, they were, they were, they were playing pretty damn good at the beginning of the season. Now, it's 162 games. I get all that, but I don't know. Yeah, that plus 2,500 is wild to me because they're, only, they're projected at 77 wins by fan graphs. Reds are 79. Brewers are 81. Cubs are 81. Cardinals are 83. So they're all bunched together, plus 2,500 for a team that's that close in the win total projections. Uh, I do think that is a a very good sneaky value. I would be surprised if they win the NL Central. I just don't think it's uh, I don't think it's that far fetched uh, as uh, as Vegas is uh, making out to be. But you know, Vegas the teams the they do right more than not, huh? Yeah. Uh, next position, left field. Yeah, if this set turned out to be a platoon, this would be a very strong platoon for the Reds. Uh, Will Benson and Jonathan A. This is why, though, I can't quit Jonathan India, man. You put him as the right-handed platoon with Will Benson. I know it's not the position he wants. I don't know how happy he would be. Probably not super happy. But, man, that is a bona fide. Uh, man, Will Benson's a well-above-average hitter against right-hand pitching. I think Jonathan India can be an absolute really good hitter against left-handed pitching. I know he hasn't had the drastic platoon splits yet. But I think that will kind of settle in, just kind of given his game. Ian Happ, Mr. Mr. Steady for the Cubs. Christian Yelich, he's probably going to play a lot of DH, but I, I penciled him in his left field for now. Brian Reynolds for the Pirates. And the Cardinals, the Larch, Newt Bar, Dylan Carlson platoon. This is one of the strongest positions, I think, in the NL Central, just kind of looking at what each of these teams have. Easily. Uh, easily one of the best, better position groups of the NL Central, um, listen, if, if Jonathan Indy is going to be able to be serviceable in left field, and I make the joke, and I don't mean this, I know he's a Middletown guy, but you know, if, if Kyle Schwarber is capable of playing left field, it gives me hope that Jonathan Indy can play left field as well. I don't think it's a position that requires some significant, incredible athlete to play it relatively well. The only concern is, is that we've tried to put infielders into the outfield before, and it just hasn't been all that good. And uh, I don't want to make Nick Senzel ruin the, the the my perception of all infielders trying to play outfield because there's no doubt that there's some that have done it successfully. Um, it's just like if an athlete like Nick Senzel has struggled with it, is what does it look like when Jonathan India goes out there? You know, I don't know. I, I I'm going to reserve judgment though because I feel like every time you go into what your true opinion of it, of it would be, you're only you really only can fail, right? Like I don't want Jonathan India to fail. Just because it makes it look like, oh, Trace didn't believe in him and, and, and he wants to be right. I hope Jonathan Indy goes out there and I hope he plays better than what my brain says that he will. And by God, if he does do that, it gives it gives this team a lot of flexibility. Like Jonathan India, let's also say, he can play first base on occasion if needed and he can play second base on occasion if needed. On occasion is the term that I really want everybody to understand. It, it can't be a lot. It can't be a lot, and it can't be a lot. Because if it's a lot, uh, just golly day. But he can also he can also DH. Remember last definitely. year how many how many games Henry Ramos was the Reds DH. Uh, no but doubt. Listen, this team is significantly better than the team last year. Like we can agree on that. The only thing that I would caution people in saying is that the team last year played great baseball, though for an extended period of time. Whether they are as good as they are or they're not, I don't know. But if you want to say they played over their heads, they played over their heads fine. Okay, that's fine if you want to say that. But they did it for like two months. So it's it, you, it's, it's, it's not easy just to replicate what they did last year for a two-month stretch, even if they are better. And I'm hopeful the fact that since they are better, then we're not going to be in a position where, where you know we're relying on them to play over their head per se. Um, Jonathan India can make this baseball team better. There is no doubt about that. The issue comes the issue comes with whatever attitude there may be when it comes to 
what it is that they're asking him to do. And let me be very clear, neither me nor you are saying that Jonathan is going to be a problem if he's asked to play a different position. I'm just saying that based off of either the quotes, whether the way the media has construed it a little bit, and again, I'm not trying to push the media under the bus. I'm just saying in general, it doesn't seem like this guy is going to be that happy, motivated, to play the position that we all want him to play and what he probably should play for what is the best in this team. And that is left field. And unfortunately for him, we've talked about this before, if he, if he, if he were to play left field, it's probably going to devalue what he would be in the open market. So, if, but I don't know how many teams... We're not going to do this on Jonathan Indy again. We're going to move to the next position. But in general, this is a, this is a genuine question. How many teams actually view him as a second baseman still? Like, the Reds aren't the only ones that are like, man, I don't know if we can play him at second. Like, the rest of the baseball, hell, you got guys in Canada making highlight tapes so their they're, the Toronto Blue Jays don't try to, you know, take him as their second baseman. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but... Yeah. I mean, you have to also remember, um, no matter what he wants to do, He's playing for contracts right now. He's playing for arbitration money. So um, if he's part of this team, you know, I, I get the whole, you know, we and, and I, I think David Bell's great at this. He, I think his, his best quality is keeping his team together and his team cohesive. And I think that's a, a big piece of the, of the Reds. As analytically minded as I am, I, I believe in the, 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 the need for, um, you know, a common goal and keeping everyone, um, you know, all on the same message. But he right. does, is playing for... For money, but one one point on yes, the Reds played above their heads for two months. There's no question about that. Reds also started seven and fifteen with a oh, dumpster fire of a roster in April, and last year struggled in September largely because of their lack of depth. I hopefully a better roster in April, more depth in September can make up for I think natural regression that will happen in in um um from from what they did overachieved in in uh in june and july and the interesting thing is how does that all piece together over 162 games what does the win total spit out to that's the answer i don't know they have 15 they have 15 plus wins of what they were projected last year to this year so my camera is about to die so there's that and i will get a new battery in it as fast as possible um next position all right third base uh i got no Marte marte here alone i i think that's he he's I think he's got every opportunity to be the Reds opening day third baseman and be every day there. Um, I, I know our guy Reds in four felt a little differently, thought it was possible that he could start the year at triple A. I don't think that's happening, but you know, we'll see the Cubs. They got Michael Bush. Um, I really love this pickup for them. I thought it was a really good pickup. Uh, a guy that, um, you know, didn't really have a lot of success when he, we got his opportunities with the Dodgers, but man, cracking into the Dodgers, um, lineup as a prospect is, is certainly tough, but he was a highly, highly regarded hitter. Um, and I think is a good fit for them. Uh, the Brewers, man, this is just where you go. How are they going to win games? Um, Andrew Monastario, who was an elite defensive player, but, uh, you know, not really much with the bat. And then a uh, tie block is maybe the other option there. He's a non roster invitee. That's kind of where the Brewers are at. And then the pirates could Brian Hayes. Uh, I would expect that he's going to take a leap this year. Um, just a really, really good young player. Looked really good at the end of the year last year. And then for the Cardinals, Nolan Arenado, uh, I think he's con going to continue to regress, but his regression still might be the best third baseman in this division. That's just where, where this is. This is another fun competitive division. Um, but I'll say this. I, I, I know Elvi Marte is a player that I'm I'm really high on. Um, I could see him. I think it's, it's likely he's going to struggle this year a little bit. But I, I think he's as good as anyone in this in this uh, in this position class in the NL Central. I think Noelve is the prospect that I am most excited about out of all of them. Um, I would put Matt McLean right behind him, and I know that people. I know, and and, and it, you know what the beautiful thing is I'm not out on L. I I I, I could be just as excited about Ellie as, as anybody else as well. Not downplaying what Ellie can be. And I and you heard what I said before last year about Ellie. I think he genuinely can be the best player in the world. Um, but I think that, this, that the floor, in my mind, 
between Marte and McLean excite me. Um, but I could be, like I said, it doesn't mean that I'm not excited about Ellie. Noel Vey to me just looks like a natural born, God given, talented hitter. I don't think it's going to be difficult for him to really replicate what, what we would like for him to continue to do. And if you can hit at the major league level, more times than not, you're going to find a position or they'll find a position for you. And he looks and he has looked smooth enough at third base to be, to be able to be serviceable there. But even if that ends up not being the case or, or one of these younger guys beneath him comes up and, and maybe Ellie ends up being the best shortstop in the, in the world, and let's just say, and I know this isn't fair to Arroyo, but let's just say he comes up and he's great and they got to find a position for him. So they want to they want to take his defensive abilities and put him somewhere in the infield. And the next thing you know, you got it full again. Noel Vey, I think, is more than capable of moving to another position. Noel Vey also reminds me of a guy that um, as he matures and gets older, um, he he also looks like a guy that can that has the ability to uh, become what's the right word here I don't want to make it sound like I, um, I'm gonna downplay like his body type but he looks like a guy that can that can fill out um, and I'm not suggesting that he's gonna become fat okay let's all be clear about that um, Manny Machado but okay and I, and I would even say like um, now this isn't fair but Miguel Cabrera in a certain you could you could argue very very similar type body type to where just as they mature, the shoulders get bigger, and they are going to hit. And that's what I think Noelve is going to do. So I'm not suggesting that he's going to have the same career as Cabrera. I think that's very unfair. And there's my screenshot, maybe. Yep, there it is. Nice. Um, all right, so <clears throat> here's the thing. Here's the thing about um, third base, though, is that Candelario, you can make the case that if it gets really, really bad, that's where that depth that's where that depth is helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I do think Kate Lawyer probably makes a, a decent amount of starts over at third base. Where are you at on on Nolan Arenado? He's he's a real wild card for the Cardinals in this division. You know, twenty twenty you know, he, he was obviously elite with the Rockies, had um about as good of a five year run at third base as anyone in recent memory long time one of the best five run year runs ever probably for a third baseman uh comes over to the cardinals first year uh in 2021 112 weighted runs created plus four one player still really good uh, uh 2022 150 weighted runs created plus seven win player an elite level player and then last year he was down to 107 weighted runs created plus only a 2.6 win player Defense looked like it actually was finally regressing a little bit. He's going to be 33 years old. Can, can we put the Mike Moustakas jinx on him? Oh, or? no. <laughs> oh, no. I don't think you're going to put the Mike Moustakas jinx on the man. That's hard to do. If you do, good for us. Good for the Reds. I don't think that's happening. I mean, listen, this guy's been an above-average hitter every single year of his career outside of two, and the only two that he hasn't been – is is basically his rookie season in the year that he only got he played 48 games. So, he's also been consistently playing 130, 140 plus games every single year. So, Arenado is a, is is a guy that I fully expect, especially in the Cardinal uniform. It feels like the Cardinal uniform uh, just magically makes guys play a little bit better longer than they're supposed to anyways. And uh I'm hoping that mystique one day wears off, right? Like I hope my kids one day they're like, oh, the Cardinals, they're terrible. Like they're, they talk about them like the Pirates, you know, that, that would really make my heart uh, be full inside if that ever comes to be. But, but um, I think he's still, so his OPS plus, if we want to use that as the metric here, uh, his OPS plus in uh, his, well, he, it wasn't, he wasn't a hurt situation. It's when, um, he moved from it was COVID, so my apologies. But um, twenty the forty eight games. I mean, correct. Yeah, it was COVID. So I was just looking at the games played, not looking at the year. So my apologies. But let's just say you take the forty eight the forty eight game season out. COVID. The dude's the dude's been above OPS plus. He's been a one thirty three, one thirty, one thirty one, one nineteen, one fifty one. His first 
or excuse me, a second year in St. Louis at age 31. And then obviously last year he, he regressed to 109. You're asking the question, is he going to be sub, is he going to be basically 100 or sub 100? Um, because he, he has regressed. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. He's going to be above 100. Yeah, but he's an interesting player to watch. I, I do think he, he um, you know, changes a little bit of the trajectory. But, you know, just looking at him after July last year, he was below 100, July through uh, the end of the year. So, But I, he, he did end the year early. Um, I, I, I don't know if it was a, a full blown injury leaving the year earlier, or if it was, uh, you know, we're about to lose, we're losing 90 plus games, just take it off, get healthy type thing. But, uh, right. yeah, he's definitely an interesting player to watch. Um, he's, he's at that cusp of, of, all right, is he going to fight through father time and, 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 and beat him off for a couple more years? Or is it really going to start catching up with him quick? It, it's really hard to predict that kind of player. I think the easiest thing to say about a player like that or a player in the situation that they've been in is the, is the, the, the quickest way for them to regress is going to be injury, right? Because it's a lot difficult. To, it's a lot yeah. more difficult to come back from an injury at that age and like it or not with Moose, but that's part of the Moose. That's part, can we at least agree a little bit? I know we don't, none of us really like him, but we can all agree that that's probably some of the regression that Moose had was that, you know, he got hurt and he just was never the same, never came back to what we ultimately wanted him to be. Yeah. Yeah. No question about it. And I also think if uh, 2020 was a full year, we might view them a lot differently too. You know, if that team gets to play 162 games, that team wins the NL central that year with full crowds and all that kind of stuff. And he has a good year. Like he was actually pretty decent. still that year, we right. might view that a lot differently too. So, all right. To the, actually, I think probably the most cut and dry position in the NL central. I have, five players listed. I, I think they're all pretty well set in stone. Cardinals may be the only one, but I think it's still pretty close. Of course, the Reds, Ellie De La Goat, uh, Cubs, Dansby Swanson, uh, Brewers, Willie Adamas, Pirates, O'Neill Cruz, Carl's Mason Wynn. Uh, he was a top 20 prospect when he got called up at the end of last year. Uh, didn't hit really well at the end of the year, but I, I would be surprised if they send him down. I think he's going to be on the opening day roster. Elite glove. Question is, will the bat kind of get there? um with them but uh man this is a really really good position group of the NL Central um I'm taking Ellie over anyone else but I will say I think the gap between Ellie and O'Neill Cruz is, is is closer than most Reds fans and myself probably really want to admit well O'Neill Cruz looked like an absolute world you know world-class player on opening day I mean he he if Ellie, if Ellie replicates what O'Neill Cruz did in Great American Ballpark on opening day, the city is going to be on fire. Um, can we can we all admit that this this is so interchangeable right now that it's really really difficult to say which one you'd rather have? I think you know, no offense to win, but um, if you gave me those four options. Uh, Adamas obviously would be maybe on the bottom of those, but Adamas, let's not act like he's not a good player. Dansby, Dansby's the, the interesting one because I think Dansby is slept on a little bit because he plays for the Cubs and we don't like him, but yeah, I don't know, man. He's the best. He's the best defensive player in the sport. I mean, well, that, that matters yeah. at that position. Uh, I mean, he, yeah, I. I I don't necessarily think the Dansby Swanson contract is something I would be like super thrilled about long term for the Cubs, but in 2024, I mean he's an elite player um, with his defense. So, yeah, I, I think Ellie Dan, I think Ellie Swanson and Cruiser in a class of their own. I think Adamas, if you watch him anytime he plays anyone other than the Reds, you probably wouldn't be as uh, um, high on a, as high on him. <laughs> um, but I mean he's a good player too, and Mason Wynn. I mean. Like this guy was a top twenty prospect in the sport, um, so you can't you can't ignore him, even though he definitely does feel like a distant fifth right now. Yep, uh, that's the strongest position group. Is I guess ceiling wise, right? Ceiling wise, no no question about it. That's 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 the strongest. Yeah, for sure. Um, where I'd are we going now? Second base. Makes sense. Second base. Uh, Reds, Matt McLean. Cubs, Nico Horner. Uh, the Brewers, this is another one of these positions. You just go, what? Uh, Bryce Terang, Owen Miller. Uh, the Pirates, they got like three options here. 
uh, I really had, had no nowhere to go. Um, now Paguro, um, Juan Bay, and then uh, Nick Gonzalez is another guy uh, kind of in the mix. And then Nolan, Nolan Gorman had a monster first half for the Cardinals last year. Uh, tailed off a little bit, but he is a really, really good hitter. A guy that is like built for Great America Ballpark. So he's a guy that really always scares me. Uh, whenever the Reds have a right-handed pitcher on the mound, he has a left-handed batter. Uh, but uh, yeah, Matt, I think, you know, Matt McClain, Nico Horner, Nolan Gorman, uh, I, I think they're all pretty close. I, I, I know Cubs fans will say Nico's heads and above, but um, I think those three are pretty close together there. They are close. I would actually agree with Cubs fans in saying that Nico, out of all of them, probably would be the one that I would say is is the best um, currently. Nico Horner's a great player, man. Um, but I, I, I love Matt McClain. That dude is just a gamer. And it just comes down to, and you, you, you go through each one of these positions, and I'm at the point now where I'm just thinking to myself, like, whether we whether we try to tame the excitement, I don't really know what to do with it. You know, it's like these guys are legit players, man. I really do believe that. It seems like uh, something I said on off the bench earlier today. I'll say it again here: is this? It feels like we got a glimpse into a trailer or the pilot series of a new TV series that's getting ready to debut on your favorite streaming platform, and it was really like exciting. It was everything that you would want in a TV series. And it kind of feels like we are at the very first season or the maybe you want to call it the second season of a of a five or six season um, storyline. And I'm just hopeful, if anything, that we continue the momentum that was built from the previous season. I hate to put expectations on this team right now because as we go through each one of these position groups, I look and I think, well, they're basically rookies or... This is their sophomore campaign, and we've only seen them have 500 at-bats at the major league level or the 600 at-bats, whatever it is. I mean, let's be honest. We've seen Jose Barrero have as many at-bats as we've seen some of these guys that we are you know, quote-unquote counting on to carry us to a place that we've never seen before. And I say we as in my demographic, obviously um, 35 and younger, has not ever experienced a playoff win um a series win in the playoffs and to say we're all starving for it would be an understatement and i think that this core group of kids and that's what they are right now i think they're the ones that are going to get it done so i'm sure we're moving on to first base but i wanted to add that nugget yeah it, it it's you know there, there's plenty of regression candidates for the reds i won't sit here and pretend like it's not, but it's just nice when you go through every player on this, you're like Reds players. If they're not number one, they're not far away. You, you don't have to squint too hard to be like, yeah, they could be the best player of that position group. And I think that's just, you know, what really excites me. All right. First base, we have uh Jamer Candelario holding the spot down for the Reds uh, Cubs. Matt Mervis. I uh, really struggled when he got his chance, but man, he just dominated in the minor leagues. Um, he's a guy that I would not sleep on. Um, really, really talented hitting prospect. They still have Patrick Wisdom. The Brewers, man, I this this signing was the one that probably the one signing the NL Central this offseason that that gave me the most. Oh, I hate that. Uh, that was this one uh, because he is the perfect fit for them. Um, you know, bouncing back and uh, man, they needed that kind of bat in that lineup. Um, but yeah, that was just a great pickup for them. Pirates don't sleep on the Rowdy Telez, Connor Joe platoon. Uh, those guys can both, uh, you know, hold that side up. And then uh, the Cardinals with Paul Goldschmidt, kind of in that same Nolan Arenado, fighting back father time, uh, still a really good player. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Trace, is this maybe the one position where you look at Candelario and you go, all right, he's not on the Reese Hoskins, Paul Goldschmidt level, but I don't know. I still don't even think it's that big of a gap. I don't think the gap's huge, and you never know what a new ballpark in New Jersey will do um, for Candelario. It's um, it's a unique situation. I, I I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know. I don't I don't really want to sit here and suggest that that if Candelario doesn't perform, then you really scratch your head and you wonder because without question, this signing of all the signings. You probably were like, hey, 
I'm not suggesting that you already felt like you had something there, but you could you could have made the case to me that of all the depth areas, that was the one area that maybe they didn't need it. However, saying that, I'm not. I understand why the Reds did do it. Um, I just hope he has a a, a, a I want to say a great year, but I just hope that he plays up to what we he should. Right? It's like I would rather him. If you if you gave me three options guaranteed right now. He was going to be a below average player. He was going to be just what he's been in his whole career, or he was going to come out and be the MVP, which is absurd to say. But I'm just saying in general, like you gave me that option, and you said they, I, I could, I could guarantee you would guarantee me. Oh no, <laughs> the, this stream is going off the rails here. Um, if you guaranteed me that he was going to be the player that we signed and we'd hoped he would be, I would take that instead of flipping a coin for being below average and MVP. I know people think I'm crazy for that, but that's the that's the uh, thought process that I have at least when it comes to these guys. Um, Nick right now has a situation going on either with his webcam or whatever it may be. Who knows where we're at right now? We're in. We're in off season form here, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear can you hear me at least? Yeah, I hear you great, man. We'll just keep this why not? This is why the people tune in, baby. We got 125 plus in the chat. We got some great questions in the chat. We're gonna get to here in a second. And you know what? We are uh, on January 30th, 2024, and we are, as they say, not in mid season form. This is uh, if anything, pure comedy. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. Weird. Mine was charging. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I saw some, some people in the chat. Uh, Dex position designated a hitter. I do think Christian Encarnacion and, and Strand leads the Reds in, in starts at first base. Um, but just it, for the purpose of this exercise, Christian Encarnacion and Strand also might lead the Reds in starts at DH. And, and he's the more logical person to put in this spot. Uh, so DH, I have CES for the Reds. Uh, the Cubs, Christopher Morrell, probably. I, I, I it was really hard to pick a DH. They don't have a true DH, which I know when we were talking earlier in the show, Trace, I said, they're the team that I feel like really should go out and make that splash on Soler or on J.D. Martinez because they have a big need for that. Uh, the Brewers, Jake Bowers, um, I, I mentioned earlier, Christian Yelich probably sees a lot. Reese Hoskin probably sees a lot here. Um, and then Jake Bowers can play first base and the outfield. Um, Pirates, going to run it back with Andrew McCutcheon. And then the Cardinals, uh, Brendan Donovan, Luke, and Baker. Um, I'll, I'll come right out of the gates. If these are the, the designated hitter crop, I'm taking CES 150 times out of 100. Um, This is the scary part. I'm, what I'm getting ready to say is somewhat scary for the Cubs, right? I could see them, I could see them end, easily re-signing Bellinger. Now, whether Bellinger is going to be the MVP-type player that, that, that you know, he did, I don't want to say last year, but he's a great player, right? And but he's also fallen off the the basically fallen off the face of the earth in some seasons as well. I could see a world where they go get him and they get JD Martinez. And I hate to say this, but if they get both of those guys, that that that's a pretty big deal. Um I know that JD is kind of getting up there in age, but JD Martinez has been an unbelievable hitter for a very long time in this league. And, you know, ultimately my Every time I go over to my parents' house, my stepdad reminds me that he's still on the market and that he has, uh, you know, the best hitter available still. And uh, he, you know, for all intents and purposes, he was hoping he'd be a Cincinnati Red. But I think with between Candelario and CES, I don't think that's going to be a move in the deck of cards for the Cincinnati Reds. So where does he go? I don't know, but I hope it's not the NL Central. Uh, I just don't know if this position group's Final is, is what I'm getting at here with the Cubs. Yeah. Outside of that, I agree with you. I, I see ES. I mean, hey, he has it the biggest upside without question. But I also think you could scratch Christopher Morrell and put J.D. Martinez in a heartbeat or Soler. Um, I don't know if Soler. I guess you could put him at DH for the Cubs. I don't really know their outfield positions off the top of my head that well. But um, but that's that's kind of where I stand with this position group. Yeah, I mean... and. Morocco play multiple positions so they can move him around. Um, I, I do agree. I think they will go get a DH. I think they're gonna they're waiting for the market. Um, maybe when one of Solaire or Martinez sign, they'll go get the other one. Or if they get a price they like on them, I think they're just trying to wait out the market on that. But yeah, I agree. I do think they will uh, go add someone. 
All right, Trace, and then your favorite position, catcher. Uh, I, I, sorry, Tyler, I had to put you in with Luke Maley. I feel like Luke Maley's earned his his spot up on this list. Um, uh, so Tyler Stevenson, Luke Maley for the Reds, Cubs, Jan Gomes, and then uh, Miguel uh, Amaya. Really, really good. I, I know I was writing a little bit about um, him for some of the previews I do for some other ventures. And uh, he's a really, really good catching prospect for the Cubs. He's a guy to watch out. Uh, the Brewers, they got William Contreras, who just absolutely broke my heart last year. Uh, the Pirates, um, uh, Indy Rodriguez is uh, out for the year um, with a, a UCL tear. Uh, so Henry Davis, who had been mostly playing in the outfield last year, if you remember, looked really rough. Remember, he dropped the ball against the Reds, assuming he's going to take over the primary catching hitters. He was the number one uh, draft picked out of Louisville. Uh, so he's going to be kind of thrown into the fire, but obviously an incredibly talented. And then the other Contreras, Wilson with the Cardinals. Uh, I guess if, if Trace, there was one position you didn't feel as good about for the Reds as this, but I don't think it's impossible that the Reds could at least find themselves in the middle of the pack if uh, if Tyler Stevens takes a big leap and Luke Maley just does what he did last year. Yeah, Carrick asked earlier in the earlier in the show what position group scares us the most. This is it. Um, I don't think it's even close. Um, yeah, I just and it's nothing against these guys. I, I don't. I have nothing against like Tyler. I hope he bounces back and plays well. I just it's more or less defensively. When I think about a catcher, I, I I'd like I'd like I'd like to be confident when the game's on the line and there's a tying run at third base with uh, you know. With with the eighth inning and beyond, I don't know if I'll ever be there with Tyler in that regard. But you know, hey, maybe he he can get better. I I know that um um I I don't know. I Luke Maley, if you if if you told me that Luke Maley by the end of the season was going to be uh, was going to be the the top guy on the depth chart, I would not be shocked. You could also tell me that Tyler Stevenson bounce backs has a great year and one is one of what. Well, here's the thing about this position is that if he bounces back and, and has an OPS plus of, you know, whatever, 110, that is an elite catcher, right, if they can catch the ball. And I don't know, I don't know, Nick. I don't know where you feel or how you feel about it, but I just worry about the catch and the ball part significantly. It's not even just like, oh, you know, I'm being picky here. I'm talking just... What you gain by him being a little bit of above average hitter, I worry about what we would lose in tight baseball games that mean a significant to, to a significant amount uh, late in the postseason. Yeah, Tyler Stevens is just he's such a wild card with this team. I, I don't know if if in in twenty twenty two it and in twenty twenty one he was that bad defensively or if it was just because the games didn't matter as much, right? right. You didn't notice those things as, as much. I mean, he didn't feel like he was that bad. It felt like it was a massive regression or just mental he, thing or coming back off the injury. I, it felt like, so I, I don't think Tyler Stevens is going to be a, even an average defensive catcher next year. My hope for Stevenson is he could be a suitable, like a decent, like a, not a massive liability, take a little bit of a step there and then just get back to the Tyler Stevenson that's a you know ten to twenty percent above average hitter, and right. I think you get both those, and you add Luke Maley as that that really good um, complementary piece to Stevenson. I think the position can at least be not a liability for the Reds. But I agree, there's no question about it. This is the biggest position of concern, without a doubt, going into the season. The crazy thing about this, and this is the scary part to a certain extent about what, what happens when you have a lot of young players, is that if you told us that three years ago or two years ago, you know, I don't know, we'd probably laugh about the idea that Tyler Stevenson was going to be one of the, the, one of the guys that we were going to be concerned about. And the last thing I'm going to say is uh, I said there was three X factors on this team. This is the second one. I think Tyler Stevenson is another X factor, and I think that he, he could be – a significant upgrade to what we came to expect last year, or he could be a, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, a, a hindrance to ultimately giving this team a chance to get to the postseason and win. So I don't know. I, I'm not completely out on Tyler just based off my eyes and uh, years of being around this game. 
I worry about his athleticism. I worry about his mobility because he's not going to get any younger. And usually you're not going to get a lot more fluid as you get older. Um, you know, it's kind of like you either have it or you don't to a certain extent when it comes to when it comes to athleticism. And, you know, no offense, Nick, and no offense to me, but me and you could go out and we could train for the next 10 years and neither one of us will ever play in the NBA. And it's just because we, we, aren't, built, we aren't built for it. We're not cut out for it. So I'm not trying to kill Tyler for saying something like uh, comparing to us trying to get to the NBA with him being a major league catcher. But that's kind of the, the concern I have is that I don't even know if it's in the deck of cards. We'll find out. Nick? Yeah, I'm here. Um, last position group. Are we gonna do uh are we gonna do starters and relievers or what's the what's the theory here? I uh, I decided earlier today to make a business decision and just stop at that and uh that's I think fair. That was a uh, um uh, a smart decision. Uh we'll, we'll do that next week. Yeah, I think the people like our faces. If you if you're worried about that, no, listen. The people like the people like your webcam image, and they like my smile. So don't don't feel like you have to to hide that for the rest of the show. Um, I guess is there anything that we missed? Anything that we missed? Chat. You can always chime in if you feel like we missed something. <laughs> oh, no, I know. think I think we uh, I think we nailed it all. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Our faces died. I don't even know why mine's dead. I'm very confused. Well, I'm going to send you a link for uh, extra. Like, uh, it's not, uh, it was very affordable. I'm going to find it. It wasn't that much. So, um, I'll get you some batteries. I, yeah. I think mine's charged. Though. That's the weird thing, but oh, well, I don't know. Stuff happens, man. Stuff happens. Uh, any final parting thoughts from the chat? Yeah. Any chat questions? comments concerns i love that nick you picked that up been saying that since i was like 22 any questions <laughs> comments or concerns in the crowd i do 162 of these with you <laughs> you get there <laughs> joshua Moore. if reds rookies hit the sophomore slump along with green Liddell and ashcraft not performing stevenson not improving and friedel hitting his ceiling what did the reds do for future years joshua man come love on love that joshua yeah joshua let's Buddy, Pump we got vibes high, baby. We gotta, we gotta get you, uh, we gotta get you juiced up. No, I mean, I think it's, it's fair. It's a fair question. I'm, I'm not really, you know, with, with Green, I, I'm not. Green's probably one of the least of my concerned players. I, I think he's, maybe he doesn't take the leap. I expect, but I, I don't think he's gonna be bad. Um, Lodolo, it's just health. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely a concern. Ashcraft, I, I'm very hot and cold with Graham Ashcraft. I'll be honest. I, sometimes I feel like, man, this guy's a bona fide, you know, at least middle of the rotation starters. Other times I'm like, yeah, I think he's, he's out pitching his, his, his weight. So I, I don't know. Um, I get, I just think Joshua, I think it's really the hope here is the depth. You know, someone, someone that we expect on this team is going to drastically underperform and probably more than one someone's. But the, the question is, can those other guys pick up that slack? Yes. If if Ellie De La Cruz is a superstar, he could pick up two slumping players, right? Uh, right. And I would I'd also argue like there's some positions where we really we really don't have the the depth to have them slump. Um and the example I would use really quickly would be like if you told us pick between TJ Friedel, pick between TJ Friedel and Spencer Steer to slump, we all love Spencer. But I'm picking Spencer Steer to slump way before I'll ever pick TJ Friedel, just based off of the position yep. they play and the depth we have at those uh, uh, at those areas, right? Like that is uh, there's no doubt. The last X, fa X factor I was going to say here, just so folks aren't on, uh, I'm sure they're they're uh, they're hanging right there on the cliff, hoping and praying. I was going to mention it was um, I think Hunter Green is the last X factor. Certainly, there can be other players that make a huge world of difference, and Heli De La Cruz is probably towards the top of that list, and some of the other starters, but. But I think Connor Green, this is the year where if he's able to stay healthy and he's able to be, you know, what you and, and many others think that he could possibly be, that gives this team a real leg up to what they did not have last year. And uh maybe, just maybe, Frankie Montas can can uh can pull the sunny gray out of him and uh 
get himself in a position where he he has a bounce back in Cincinnati after being in New York and in Oakland. So I don't know. Uh, maybe history will repeat itself there. And if those two things happen, man, I feel really good about this team. Yeah. I think Lodolo's my my green for that just because I, I, I don't I'm not worried about Lodolo's pitching ability. I think he's there. I think he's he's a top or close to it rotation start. It's just can the guy stay healthy? Man, if he does, I, I think he's a guy that really, really pushes the red ceiling. Rob, Rob in the chat says, hey, it was in response to that last question. He says, geez, hey, guys, what do you think if they do if the plane crashes? <laughs> I mean, just the chat, man. Sometimes you guys make me laugh. That's a good one. I like that. Listen, now, those are fair questions, Joshua. That's a fair question. I think that if that happens, um, you hope they all don't regress because if they all regress, then I guess then – then uh, there's really not a whole lot this franchise can do, right? They're already, like, they're dedicated to this plan. I don't think there's a plan B that they could easily go to and fix it anyways. So we are who we are. We got who we got. We're not going to be able, the Major League Baseball has proved one thing this offseason. You can't just go out and buy a, a team anymore um, under any circumstance. The The market is completely gone. The, the Dodgers have... I don't want to say ruin baseball, but the Dodgers have done something now that, that has set a precedent. And ultimately, we're going to have to hope that the, the guys that we draft and the guys that we develop are going to be world-class players. And maybe we can keep one or two of them every so often. But more times than not, we're going to have to... Uh, we are the little engine that could. And, and I hate to say that. It sucks to say that. Major League Baseball sucks in regards to its... It's um, equalities, and maybe one day that'll get somewhat fixed. I don't know, but those are the facts, Nick, is that we are the little engine that could, and sometimes the little engine that could can can win it all. Um, but to sit here and act like they're not fighting a little bit of an uphill battle would be a lie, and uh, the good news is, is I think that there's a chance here that they have some young guys that can get it done. Yeah, Plan B is the number two draft pick in, in uh, the middle of the season. Yes, but that's only one guy. I mean, if they all are, if they, if they are all bad, then, but then I don't know. I won't say it because those are sincere. not happening. Yeah, it's, it's not just happening. not happening. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. All right, uh, off the bench, Tom Brenneman. He's back tomorrow. That is a uh, talk show that we do, a sports talk show that we do Monday through Friday from ten a to twelve p. Um, I think he's going to share some news on that show tomorrow and what he wants to do with it. So uh, we will all be waiting and watching. He's been kind of toying with some ideas, so I'll kind of leave that to him on what he may want to do. Maybe he shares that. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But uh, what else do we got? We got, uh, obviously, the uh, the Chatterbox Bearcats. <laughs> Not uh, Stetson. <laughs> yeah. Who do they play tomorrow? West Virginia? Uh, West Virginia, Mountain Mama, Take Me Home, Country Roads. Uh, UC Hoops live right after the game, just similar to Chatterbox Reds. They go live uh, after the West Virginia game, manana. And then, as always, we got the chatter, and we have some other things going around. We have this show, which is about to be back in full force. Full force. And I can promise you we will be in a little bit better shape as we grow closer to opening day and we'll charge our batteries. We will, we will make sure that our cameras don't die. We, our microphones hopefully sound good. Who knows? But, um, other than that, Nick, got any final parting thoughts to the lovely people that are in our chat? Trace has just been, it's been a joy to be back with you, my friend. And, uh, uh, you know, you forget how much you enjoy doing this. Uh, you know, I can be honest. It was kind of, you know, like, I, you know, I'm always excited to do the shows. I was like, oh, man, I'm kind of tired. And, you know, you, you get on the mic with Trace Fowler. And oh, please. Hours, this guy two hours pumping me two up. Two hours later, two hours later, you're still rolling, having a great time. No, it's good to be back with you, my man. Nick, same to you, bud. And I'm looking forward to taking this road trip. We'll have some more information on that as we get closer. But uh, I think it'll be pretty epic. And uh, I'm going to try to convince us to drive. So we'll see. But before we do that, do me a favor. We got some new people in the chat, I think. We have some, some OGs in the chat that have probably already done this. Is there a chance that you could go give us a rating 
and give us a review. That's the bigger thing, a review. Just say a couple of nice things about us if you, if, if you are so inclined to do so. And hopefully tomorrow we'll have a couple more new reviews and maybe we'll climb a little bit higher in those podcast rankings and we'll continue to grow and prosper with you. The best chat in the world. That is the Chatterbox Reds chat. What's up, Nick? Can I just have one review that just says Stuart Fairchild in all caps? That would <laughs> make my day. Be, oh, beat me to man. it, folks. Who's going to be there first? I'm waiting. Man. What a stray that the, the, the Louisville bats sent today. And I know people told me it wasn't a stray. That's the only way I could take it. But, hey, whatever. Fast guy that can run. Could play a pretty good outfield. Pretty decent against left-handed pitching. I don't know. He's not the world's worst player. I can tell you the world's worst player, and he doesn't play for the Reds anymore. And it kind of rhymes with Lumen. <laughs> but we'll see it. We'll see everybody again on the next one. Much love to all of you. Thank you for the birthday wishes. And final, I did not forget. Daniel Myers said, Happy birthday, Trace. Daniel, I don't know if you're still watching. It's very nice of you. Thank you very, very much. I love you. And I love everybody. And for that, we are going to send it off to the only outro that we know how to do. And that is Chatterbox Reds. See you, everybody. <laughs>